homotities or isometries. Now, when the ambient space is not the Euclidean space, uh, we have some uh, work of Halderson on Minkowski plane. He considered the self-similar solutions on this plane, and he showed that in this case, this is a not a gradient type flow. So some curves, they may evolve in decreasing uh, length, but others not. And also he showed that the soliton solutions may have a finite Minkowski length without having endpoints. So some other results on Riemannian different uh, Riemannian manifold different from the plane were given by Machen and Zo. Now uh, a few years ago, uh, with a former student of mine, Dos Reis, we worked on soliton solutions on the sphere, and I'll tell you. Uh, briefly what the results were. So if you consider a non-geodesic curve parametrized by arc length on the sphere, and you want it to be a soliton solution, so uh, it evolves by isometries, then this can only occur if and only if there exists a non-zero vector in the Euclidean space, such that the curvature of the curve is given by the inner product of the tangent vector field and this fixed vector. Now, and we also showed that for any given vector, non-zero vector of R3, there is a two-parameter family of non-trivial soliton solution to the curve shortening flow on the sphere. Moreover, those curves are defined for the whole real line. Moreover, we showed that the two ends of the curve they are asymptotic to the geodesic gamma, which is an uh, equator, of the sphere, which is orthogonal to the vector v. Now, assuming that uh, the curve intersects the equator, the equator here is in red, assuming that it, it uh, intersects in more than one point, then we show that if the norm is between 0 and 2, then it will intersect infinitely many times. And if the norm is bigger or equal to two, then the intersection can be at most a finite number of points. At each end will converge to the equator without self-intersection. So in the figure one, you can see uh, a solid on solution with a norm of the vector v being 0.5. We are considering vector V being uh, vertical. So the equator orthogonal to the vector is the red one. So in this case, the curve intersects infinitely many times the equator. If the norm of V is equal to one, we still have an infinite number of intersection points. And we had a geometrical descriptions of those curves. Uh, considering those points with extremal on, on, on certain invariants. Okay. Now, this is the case where vector V has norm equal to 2. The picture seems to indicate that the intersection is just one point. And this is the vector V with norm equal to 3. And it seems to say that there is no intersection with the equator. But this is just a picture, not a proof. Now I'll talk about the soliton solutions to the curve shortening flow on the hyperbolic plane, and this is a joint work with Fabio da Silva. So we consider a plane, uh, the hyperbolic plane H2, immersed into the Minkowski's three-dimensional space. We are considering the metric with a minus sign on the first coordinates. And as before, you can show that the curve shortening flow on the hyperbolic space is geometrically invariant if you consider this equation and you add up some tangential components on the right side. And also you can prove that this is a gradient type of flow on the arc length functional on the hyperbolic plane. Now we will consider the following notation. X will be a regular curve parametrized by arc length. T will be the derivative of X, which is a unit tangent vector field. And the normal vector field will be the product of X with the tangent. 
And the curvature, K, geodesic curvature, is the inner product between the derivative of tangent vector field and the normal. So we will consider a one parameter family of curves, X tilde. This will be a, a curve shortening flow with initial condition, a given curve X in the hyperbolic plane. If the derivative of X hat with respect to T times N hat is the geodesic curvature at time T of the curve, and you want for T equal to zero, the curve X hat to be the initial cu curve given to, for the problem. Okay, so what we want to do is study the curves on the hyperbolic plane that admits a one parameter family X hat T that evolves by isometries of the hyperbolic plane. Kathy, uh, by evolving yeah. by isometries, you mean that X hat TS is given by the composition of some uh, isometry of H2 depending on T. That's right. This is zero S. Yeah, this is what you we have exactly here in this in this slide. <laughs> uh, ah, okay, I'll say. Okay. So, so. X hat uh, will be a solution of the flow with initial condition X. And we will say that X is a soliton solution in this case of, for the flow. If X hat T is equal to a, a isometry, which depends on T times the initial curve X. So MT will be a one parameter family of isometries and you want M zero to be the identity map so that the flow at T equal to zero is the initial curve X. So the isometries on the hyperbolic plane will be an element of the Lie group, O13, that preserves the hyperbolic plane. And this is the way you can define this, the Lie group, which, is, which gives you the isometries of the hyperbolic, of the Minkowski space, three-dimensional Minkowski space. Okay, so uh, first I will tell you the results and then I will give you an idea of how the proof goes. So what we did was to prove that a regular curve on the hyperbolic plane parametrized by arc length is a soliton solution to the curve shortening flow if and only if there exists a vector, non-zero vector on the Minkowski space such that the curvature of the curve is given by the tangent vector field times V. This inner product is on the space and uh, Minkowski space, okay? Here is the geodesic curvature, and V is a vector that will exist if you start, if you want to work with a soliton solution. Now, the second theorem tells you that for any given non zero vector of the Minkowski space, there is a two parameter family of non trivial soliton solutions to the curve shortening flow on the hyperbolic plane. In this case, what we are calling non trivial are just non constant curvature. A particular case of those trivial ones are the geodesics, and we also we will see later why they are uh, trivial, the, the ones that have constant uh, geodesic curvature. We also proved that there are three classes of soliton curves on the hyperbolic plane according to the type of the vector V. We know that there are three types of vectors uh, which are not zero, which are the light-like, time-like, and space-like. So depending on the type of the vector V, we have a different family of solitons. Now we will show that the, each soliton is defined on the whole real line. And at each the end of those solitons, the curvature tends to one of the constants, minus one, zero, or one. Moreover, the curve is be embedded in the hyperbolic plane. Katie, now, Katie where, yes? may I ask you something? Yes, um, um, so no closed solitons on, no. on the hyperbolic space. No, no. And what about I, self similar? I mean, you see, the problem with the self similar is the what kind of homotheties are you going to look for on the 
uh, on the hyperbolic plane. But because here, you see, we don't uh, we don't uh, consider any specific, uh, let's say, any specific representation of the hyperbolic. Although I'm looking uh, as if it was embedded as a hyperboloid embedded in the Minkowski space, but uh, we will see later, we'll show you the pictures of uh, solitons in any of the representations of the hyperbolic plane. So we have not studied the, the homotety case because the self-similar solutions, uh, they involve either solitons or homotetes or the two of them combined. So in this case, we just studied the solitons. Okay, okay, okay. thanks. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, can, uh, I, can I just jump in? Yes, yes, sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so so you're saying we don't have a natural way to to define the homotopies, right? So there's some freedom there to sort of declare yeah. what you want homotopies to be. Yeah, that's right. You see, even in this case of this of the of the sphere, we just looked for solitons because it's something more. Uh, let's say it's uh, it's. Uh, traditional to know i mean you know what the isometries are however to to define what is an homotopy on the sphere or on the hyperbolic space plane uh, you have to decide on what you're going to look for okay do you think do you think it would be reasonable to define it as some sort some subclass in uh, in conformal in conformal maps right so maybe maybe i don't maybe yeah, it's, okay. it's nice to try. It, cool. The interesting thing is that you should find out if there are examples of uh, so of the, this kind of uh, curve that you're looking for. Because you see the definition of, of uh, curve shortening flow is something uh, more general. Mm -hmm. So because you, you are not expected to find all the solutions of the flow, which is uh, something huge, what you do is just you concentrate on the type of solutions. And so the kind of solutions that we are looking for in this, in this work is the soliton ones, so that they are evolved by isometries. But you can certainly think of other kinds of classes. Can but I also the, jump in, Cathy, for just one second? Sure, sure. So, most it is you can define them to be conformal maps where the conform well, uh, the conformal factor is a constant. Right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but in okay. the sphere, in the sphere, the only homotopies are isometries. The, okay. The, so the, group, <laughs> the conformal group of the sphere is very well known. It consists of isometries and all these. Uh, how do you call it? These uh, um, uh, these. Um, uh, I mean, of course you're right, but, but no, this, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm but sorry. This is the plane, I, right? I said something stupid. Every every conformal map is an homotopy. I'm sorry. On the sphere. Okay. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. That's on exactly the, sphere, the opposite. Right, but but on on H two, you you could have more guys. Probably, maybe, maybe right? yeah. I don't know what the conformal group of the of the hyperbolic space is. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I said something stupid. I, I I withdraw what I said. Sorry. Okay, but anyway, I think it's an interesting question, and it should be tried. I mean, if there is something in there, we'll find it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> because I can't sorry, see anybody. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you are listening. I'm to so me sorry. I'm so sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah. Actually, and, Betty, I... and what about translating? Do you have the the notion of translating soliton in the hyperbolic, or also is? Well, what would be translating? Would be going along geodesics or something like that? I don't know. In okay. every, but, well, this is just a, what I'm doing is just a guess, a, just imagining what could be. Anyway, the problem itself, as, as we just looked for isometries, was complicated enough. <laughs> so I believe that whatever, if you change the class of solutions that you're looking for, it, it will give you a lot of uh, work. I mean, you have to work on it. <laughs> Okay. Not, not sure, but I mean uh, the I mean the Green Reaper. What would be a, a Green Reaper? That that's a soliton, right? It's, yeah, but it, it, this is a very particular thing that works on the yeah. on the plane on the plane. You see? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
And the translation, because if this is a part of the isometries of the plane, yeah, translating is isometries on the plane. Yes, but yes. You don't have anything so, I mean, so transparent like that in the in the case. I mean, here we are looking to all of the isometries, but, but uh, translating is still isometry. But I, the question about the homotities would be something different. Okay. I suppose you could take infinitesimal global diffeomorphisms as vectors. Maybe, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Okay. All right. So can I go on? Or any any other question? Yes, please. Okay. So this is the second theorem. And the I mean the proof of this theorem is very long. What I will give you later is just uh, main steps of the proof. So what I'll do is first prove the, the first theorem is quite simple. And then we will, I'll give you some ideas of the proof of the theorem of the second theorem. So the first theorem goes as follows. You are starting with a soliton solution, which means that you have a family of uh, curves which evolve by isometry. So this is MT is a family of isometries of the hyperbolic plane, and you want to satisfy this inner product being the curvature, geodesic curvature of time t, and t equal to zero, you want uh, the family to be exactly the initial curve. So what you do is consider this equality, so k hat will be, you take the derivative of x hat with respect to t, and you plug in and you have this expression, and then you look at t equal to zero. When t equal to zero, you have the curvature of the initial curve. <clears throat> and you will have m prime at times zero times x. And because m of t is the identity, you just have the normal on this side. Now, m prime is an element of the Lie algebra of 013. So you can consider those three matrices, a1, a2, a3, as a basis for the this Lie algebra. So you can write M prime of zero as a linear combination of those three matrices. So you have three constant here. And then you plug in into this expression of the curvature. And using the fact that the norm of the X is minus one and that the vector N is the product of X with a tangent, you find out that X, uh, the curvature is m prime zero times x times n, you plug in and you find out that this is the tangent times this vector c1 plus c2, c2 and minus c3. So if you consider v as a vector, this vector here, given by those constants, then you obtain that the curvature is exactly the tangent times the vector v. So whenever you start with such a soliton, there exists a vector v, v non-zero, such that the curvature is the product of the tangent times the vector v. Now the converse. Suppose you have a curve that satisfies this, that satisfies this kind of equation, I mean this equality. So without loss of generality, you may consider that the vector v is a multiple of one of those three vectors, which is time-like, light-like, or space-like. So we will consider V, so depending on the type of the vector V, the curvature will be the tangent times VI, where VI is a multiple of those vector WI. Certainly you can change the signs of the W, but the important thing is just to show that uh, because of that, you, you will find a, a family of curves, so the, short, the curve shortening flow. So you have to define a flow. And so what we will do is de de define the flow according to the type of the vector. So if I'm on the i equal to 1, which is the uh, time-like, then we will define x hat to be m12 times x. m12, this is the, uh, the isometries obtained by cosine a times t. a is this constant here, which is non-zero. If the, the vector is uh, 
uh, light like then m2t will be this matrix and if it's a space like vector then you will get m3 to be this class of isometries of h2 so i define so x hat to be m one of those m's times x depending on the vector and then what we have to do is show that this flow that was defined like that will satisfy the equation of the uh, curve shortening flow. So you take the derivatives, the derivatives of m prime, etc., and then uh, you use, uh, you plug in and you use the fact that t is, you, you, you make the computation, very simple. The i appears here. So this computation here gives you minus a times minus t times omega i, and when you put inside the a and cancel the signs, you have t of s inner product with vi. But this is the curvature of the initial curve. However, because you're dealing with a family of isometries, the cur geodesic curvature does not change. So for each time t, the k hat, the curvature uh, at time t will be exactly the same as the curvature of the uh, uh, initial curve. So this shows you that you have a soliton solution for the curve shortening flow. So this shows you that looking for, uh, so they are, those curves are characterized by the fact that there is it, exists a vector, non-zero vector, such as the tangent vector times the, the tangent unit vector field times the vector is the curvature, geodesic curvature of the curve. Now yes, I'll give you, you yes. Can you show please again the 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 different types of isometries in the proof? Here. So so are these isometries special in some sense or? Yes, yes, because this one M one T. Are rotation. Uh, <laughs> rotation, but it preserves the direction of time-like vectors while this one will preserve the direction of the time-like vector and this uh -huh. one will preserve the space type uh, vectors oh, i see Th that's why there are three different ones according to the vector v that you start with perfect very nice okay. thank you good now Okay, so we did this. Okay, so now the main steps for the proof of theorem two. So because V can be time-like, light-like, or space-like, so we have three kinds, three classes of solitons. We will show that solitons correspond to solving a system of ODEs with initial conditions given in three disjoint sets. Now, as a consequence of a series of lemmas, we will show that the solitons, whoops, sorry. As a consequence of a series of lemmas, we will show that the soliton solutions are defined on the whole real line. And we will also obtain the limits of the curvature and we will prove that the solitons are embedded. So these are different steps. And uh, the, the detailed computations and, and uh, arguments are long, but I'll just give you an idea. So first I'll give you the system of ODEs that correspond to so obtaining the soliton solutions. So we consider X a curve parametrized by arc length. I consider E1, E2, E3, the three kinds of vectors. And I define three functions, which is which are alpha i to be the product of the position vector of the curve with ei, tau to be the tangent vector field with ei, and eta i to be the normal vector field with ei. So we know that obtaining the solitons is obtaining a curve is such that the curvature for each kind of vector will be a times the function t, t tau. The function tau is exactly t times the vector ei. So what uh, 
will happen is that we will show that those three functions that we just defined, they will satisfy this OD with initial condition at S equal to zero, satisfying this algebraic condition being minus one in the case of the vector uh, time-like, zero if we are on the light-like, and one if we are in the case of a vector uh, space-like. Moreover, we will show that this expression here, this algebraic expression for any S is the same constant. So if you start with minus one, you will be minus one for all S where the solution is defined up to now. Okay, so now let's prove this result. Given a curve X, you have the vector fields, which is X, which tangent vector field and the normal. Then the uh, elementary results on, on curves on the hyperbolic space will tell you that you can write the derivatives of those vector fields in terms of Tn and X. And so if you take the inner product with EI, you have now a system for alpha, tau, and eta, the system of the ordinary differential equations. Now, we are assuming that the curvature is A times the function tau. So this system here reduces to this one here. Okay, so we are substituting the curvature for a times the torsion, the tau. <laughs> okay, now observe that once you fix EI, this is a vector fixed, and you can write it as a linear combination of X, T, and N for any S, because this is a, a basis yeah, for the ambient space. So if you take the inner product of EI with itself, it will be minus one if I is equal to one, zero if I is equal to two, and one if I is equal to three. And you compute this inner product of the right-hand side here, and you will obtain exactly minus alpha I squared plus tau I squared plus eta I squared of S. So this is, uh, this is uh, satisfied for all S where the curve is defined, the solution is defined. And in particular for S equal to zero, you will get that these initial conditions will satisfy exactly this, uh, this constant, this, this algebraic relation. Now, conversely, suppose you have alpha, tau, and eta satisfying the system then you look at the system and you find out that you have those equal to zero and this is equal to zero. So because eta and tau cannot be zero simultaneously in an open subset, you find out that the curvature is equal to a times tau. It, this for each i, two and three. So this result here gives you the ODE that you have to solve with initial conditions like that to in order to obtain, I mean, soliton solutions up to now correspond to solutions of this OD. Now, next step is how the solutions are related, the solutions of the system are related to the soliton curves. So I assume you have a solution of this system. I'm not putting any more the in index I, it's just the difference is just how this algebraic relation is equal to minus one, zero, or one, that's all, okay? So suppose I have a solution of the system, A positive, and initial conditions satisfy this, then uh, there exists a curve X in the hyperbolic plane parametrized by arc length S such that the tangent and normal and X satisfy this relation. This is the relation that uh, we have between the solution of the ODE and the curve itself. And here, uh, the vector E changes according to the type of uh, initial condition that we started with, okay? Now, the proof goes as follows. Just we consider you, you have a solution. You define K as to be A times tau of S. Now, once you fix the curvature, there exists a unique curve in the hyperbolic plane whose curvature is K of S. 
that now the curve has to be uniquely determined in in the hyperbolic space when you consider the vectors x t and n on a zero for example so we can always choose those vectors such that minus alpha naught x naught plus tau zero times t plus eta zero n is equal to e where e is equal to one of those vectors so uh, this vector is determined, as I said, by the initial condition, okay? So once you have, you take the derivative of this expression for all s, using that alpha, tau, and eta, they are solutions of the system, you find out that this deriv the derivative is zero. So this is constant everywhere. And so from here, you find out that the alpha and tau and eta are exactly related uh, to the curve by these equations, by this relation, okay? Now, let's see the geometric interpretation of alpha. Once you have the curve x, I'm always looking at the hyperbolic plane as the hyperboloid into Minkowski space. And so I'm considering x1, x2, x3, and alpha of s, is the product of the position, vec uh, position vector of the curve with the vector e, depending on which kind of uh, initial condition you started with. So if e is equal to minus one zero zero, which is the case of the time-like vector, then alpha will be at, uh, x1 of s, which will be positive for all s. And you can interpret this as being the Euclidean height function with respect to the vector 1, 0, 0. If the vector E is a light vector, light-like vector, then alpha of S is x1 plus x2, which is positive, and one can see that alpha of a square root of 2 is the Euclidean height function with respect to the vector 1, 1, 0. And if E is 0, 0, 1, which is the case of the space-like vector, then alpha will be just the third, uh, third coordinate of the curve, and it's a height function with respect to the vector 0, 0, 1, and this can be positive or negative. So here you have the picture of those, the geometric interpretation of alpha. So if you have the curve here, this is the black thing here, so alpha of S will be this, uh, distance function, Euclidean distance function, uh, with respect to this vector 0, 0, 1. If you are in the case of the light light vector, then alpha over s divided by square root of 2 is this distance function with respect to this plane. And in the third case, you have the distance from the point of the curve to this plane here which gives you the interpretation of alpha as a distance function with respect to certain planes in each case. So what we just saw is that investigating soliton curves to this curve shortening flow on the hyperbolic plane is equivalent to studying the solution alpha tau eta, which are just write as psi of S, of the systems of ODE for each constant A positive and initial condition in one of those three disjoint sets of R3. These are just real numbers, okay? Where nine, this will be the initial condition for psi at zero. And so you want minus alpha square plus tau square plus eta square to be minus one, where alpha is positive, uh, zero and alpha positive in the second case, and minus alpha square plus tau square plus eta square equal to one on the third case. So what you have to do is just work out the initial the solutions of the different OD with one initial condition in one of those. And each solution is defined on a maximal interval that we are, we are going to denote by omega minus and omega plus being the extremes of this maximal interval. And whatever is the case, if you start with the initial condition in one of those sets, psi of s will be in the same set for all s. 
Okay, now the partic I want to mention particular solutions of this problem when tau is constant. As I said, we will just call them trivial solutions. And so if, uh, assume that you have a solution of the ODE defined on the interval I, and suppose that psi of zero it is in one of those sets, and you, you, you want tau to be constant. When tau is equal to constant B, this means that the curvature is constant because the curvature is A times tau. So this can only happen if, if the initial condition is in S. So the, the psi of S will be always in S. The interval of definition, the maximal interval definition is the whole real line. And B can only be minus one, zero, or one. And moreover, if B is equal to one, this psi of S will be the singular solutions of the system. And if B is minus or plus one, then the constant A has to be one, and psi of S is given as a linear solution on S, which will only depend on the initial condition alpha of zero. Now, the corresponding solution, whenever you have B equal to zero, this will be the geodesics. And in the case B, B is equal plus or minus one, then the curvature, because A also is one, then the curvature will be equal to plus or minus one, and we will call these trivial solutions. I just want to tell you that in this case here, we can explicitly give the curves. Okay, here. Uh, so in the case where I'm, in the case B equal plus or minus one, considering alpha zero to be zero, then you have a psi of S given by that, and this is a trivial solution of ODE with this initial condition zero minus one zero. And you can integrate because you see, once you have uh, the ODE, you still have to integrate in order to get the curve X. Yeah? So in this case, you can explicitly integrate. These are planar curves and the curvature is one. Oops. Okay, so this is a, pic, a figure of one of those planar curves, which is a, contained in a plane here, intersection of a plane and the hyperboloid. Now, in a series of lemmas, we have to study separately the non-trivial solutions, which are, which are contained in the subset H or C, and those contained in the subset S. We can prove that, I will not go into the details, that the function eta of s is decreasing, tau is bounded, and has at most a finite number of critical points. And also there exists an s bar such that the curve that such that alpha s, the function alpha s, is strictly monotone between omega minus s bar and s bar omega plus. Opa, what I'm doing? Okay. Now, solutions with initial condition in the set S, we can consider the differential vector field defined by that. This is the right-hand side of the system. And so you can find out that the singular points are 0, 0, 1 or minus 1. And the eigenvalues at these points are given uh, by this expression. Uh, the only difference is a plus and minus one according to the point, and it depends on the constant A. Now, the points zero, zero, plus and minus one are saddle points, and uh, psi of S is equal to zero, zero, plus or minus one for all S, and these are singular solutions. Because tau and S, uh, tau and alpha are zero, then the corresponding curve is the intersection of the upper half hyperboloid with a plane going through the origin orthogonal to 0, 0, 1. Both singular solutions correspond to the same curve, just this intersection. And at this point P, for example, 0, 0, 1, we can consider the unstable and stable sets 
uh, we are denoting WU for unstable, WS for the stable sets. And uh, so one can prove the following, that if Psi is a non-trivial solution defined on a maximal interval I with Psi of zero in one of those three sets, then the interval, maximal interval definition is the whole real line. And uh, so the corresponding curve soliton curve will be defined for all uh, real line and at each end of the curve the curvature converges to one of this constants minus, minus one zero or one now the, how we can prove this i is we start the, uh, because we know that tau is bounded we consider this differential, this because of the system of differential equations, you integrate tau, but tau is alpha prime. So you can write alpha, this difference as the integral of tau, and this will be less than or equal to m times s minus s zero. S zero. So there exists an s bar such that alpha is monotone on those two half intervals. Now in each interval, alpha, is not if alpha is not bounded then we get that extremes are plus or minus infinity if alpha is bounded then because of this algebraic expression here and because eta is decreasing then this will imply that omega plus or minus will be plus or minus infinity and the integral interval of definition is the whole real line now, you, we know that the curvature is A times tau for the corresponding curve. And we know also that tau is bounded with at most a finite number of critical points. So there exists a limit of the curvature when S goes to plus or minus infinity. Now, if the initial condition psi of zero is on the unstable set, then the limit of tau will be zero and then the limit the curvature will be zero when s goes to minus infinity if the if the initial condition is on the stable set then the limit when s goes to plus infinity of tau will be zero and so the limit of the curvature also will be zero otherwise one can show that this limit of norm of alpha s S going to plus or minus infinity is plus infinity. And because we have this relation with algebra, uh, algebraic relation between alpha, tau, and eta, then one can show just dividing by alpha square that this limit eta square over alpha square is one. And now you want to find the limit of minus eta over alpha. This, if you this because of L'Hopital, you can define of the, as the limit of minus eta prime over alpha prime. But here you use the system of differential equations and you find that this is A times tau. So this means that the limit of the curvature, which is A times tau, is equal to plus or minus one, because this here, here is plus or minus one. Okay, so this will tell you how the curvature goes to the, uh, uh, when, when S is going to plus or minus infinity. Now, the proof of the main theorem goes in big steps like that. You start with any vector V in non-zero vector V in the Minkowski space. So you consider V as A times one of those vectors. Uh, e time-like, time light-like, or space-like, A positive. Then you consider psi of S a solution of the system of ODEs defined on the maximal interval, I, and initial condition psi of zero satisfying one of those three conditions, meaning that psi of zero is one of those sets, H, C or S. Then we already uh, saw that once you have a solution like that, then there is a soliton curve X of S, which has curvature equal to A times tau of S 
And such that the solution alpha, tau, and eta is related to the curve as the inner product of x, t, and n with the vector e. So there are three classes of solitons depending on the type of the vector v. Moreover, there is for each vector fixed, there is a two parameter family of non trivial soliton solutions defined on the maximal interval. Why do I say that two parameter families? Is because you have to choose initial condition satisfying this, instead of, ha of having the freedom of choosing three numbers, you actually have just two because alpha naught, tau naught, and eta naught have to satisfy an algebraic relation. So this means that you just have a two-parameter family of non-trivial soliton solutions. So, Ketty, uh, yes? why the, the maximal interval of existence is the same for the whole family? That's, that's uh, obvious from, from ODEs, or...? Uh, no, no, you have to... It's not... It's not obvious, but you see what you have to use. It's, I just skipped this because, I mean, I just gave you an idea here, you see? That this, this, this lemma tells you that the interval of definitions is the whole real line. Yeah? We actually, it, it, this is the case because what we do is study which these details I did not put here, is study how the curves, the, the three functions, alpha, tau, and eta behave. So what you, you have is tau is bounded, and even if alpha is bounded or not bounded, you, you use this relation, algebraic relation, and the fact that eta is decreasing, and then you, you find that the interval is the whole real line. It's not a simple step, but I'm just giving the main steps. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, where was I? I guess here. So the lemma tells you that interval is a real line. And also we just saw that the curvature converges to one of those three values. And now we want to show that the curve is embedded. Now, one of the lemmas tells you that there exists S bars such that alpha is strictly monotone on the intervals minus infinity S bar and S bar plus infinity. Now, as we saw, alpha of S describes the Euclidean height of X with respect to one of the fixed planes. Then, X does not have self-intersection in each of these intervals, open intervals, okay? Because alpha is strictly monotone in, on each of these open intervals. Now, if alpha is monotone in the whole real line, then X of S is embedded, yeah? Now, if alpha is not monotone in the whole real line, then S bar is the unique critical point. Now we will show that it will be embedded because by arguing by contradiction. So assume that the curve has a, a, a self-intersection. So we have S1 less than S bar and S2 bigger than S bar, such that the curve X of S1 is the same point as X of S2. Now you consider sigma to be the simple region bounded by the restriction of the curve to the, this closed interval S1, S2. Now you consider theta to be the external angle between the tangent vectors at S1 and S2. This will be less than or equal to pi. And then we apply gauss bonnet theorem here. So you will have zero is less than or equal to two pi, the characteristic Euler of sigma, minus theta. And this tells you that the integral is equal to the integral of the Gaussian curvature of sigma plus the geodesic curvature of the curve on this interval. Now, this is equal to minus the, the area of sigma because the curvature of the hyperbolic plane is minus one. And the curvature will be replaced by A times tau because we have a soliton, yeah? 
So this is minus this integral, this area of sigma. And because tau is alpha prime of S, uh, the solution of the ODE, then this integral will be A times alpha of S2 minus alpha of S1. However, we just said that X, S1 and X of S2 are the same. So alpha S2 and alpha S1 will be the same. So this is equal to minus this area, which is less than zero. And this is a contradiction. So even uh, when it's not alpha is not monotone, X will, does not have uh, self-intersection. So X is embedded on the intervals uh, minus infinity S bar and S bar plus infinity. And from the lemmas, the two ends of the curves are unbounded. So this is an embedded curve. So now I'll give you some uh, figures that show some of the soliton solutions according to the type of the vector that you start with. Uh, so here I, we are considering a vector which is time-like. Uh, and the constant a to be equal to one, this is the hyperbolic uh, plane in the hyperboloid uh, model inside the Minkowski three space. So this is the curve. And uh, here you have the, the same curve on the Poincare ball, uh, representation of H2. And this is the curve uh, in the half plane representation of H2. So this is what happens when the vector is time-like. Now, the second case here is the, whenever you consider a light-like vector, and as before, this is the hyperboloid, this is the Carré ball, and this is the half space model. And here, when the, curve, the vector is a space like vector, and so you have a curve uh, that goes infinity, etc. etc. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, so it's time for questions. For more questions. Okay. <laughs> um. uh, Katie, can you show the pictures again? Yes. So these ones are the first one. Uh, this one, I mean oh. the the. They all, all of them, they kind of look to, to some solution by Halderson in the plane, right? I mean, this, this one, uh, it, it looks similar, right? Uh, no, the, but this, you see, uh, the second one, I think that Haldorson called the, the spirit or something coming out in figure eight, the next one. Oh, that's it. Okay, this? Yeah, that, uh, but, that he, but you see, he was working with in the case of the uh, two-dimensional Minkowski space, yeah, because he has two different pr t uh, papers. One is in the Euclidean space, and the other one is in the Minkowski plane. Which one are you? No, no, on about? the on the plane, on the classic. Oh, on the regular plane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that is. It's like they look the, the same, I don't know, very, very similar to some of the plane uh, solutions in some sense. That in the plane, you have the Green Reaper, which is different, and you have the uh, Ying Yang, which is sort of different also. They are, uh, they don't look to me. Yeah, <laughs> it's like this, they, they look like the rotational, the rotational yep. solitons in the plane. But you see the rotational, the, the yin yang, yeah? And there, there are yeah. some other examples also. Not, he, he, um, uh, 
who, who gave the whole classification? I guess it was Haldersen, yeah. Maybe, yeah, was it? Yes, I guess so. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, he was, he gave the whole of them. But the self-similar, so he includes both of them, yeah? The translation and... Not the, sure, sure, but... The, but the, yeah. the, the, precisely the purely rotational, yes. the purely rotational, which are solitons in your sense, they mm -hmm. look like to, to, to some of these, but I mean, just in the, as in the, the middle, point. with the Poincaré, uh, with the Poincaré... Ball representation, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very uh, nice. Yeah, because of the green, I mean, the yin yang has something like that because it, it goes around a circle. It's a circle. Yes, yes. Yeah. But in this case, when you are looking to the circle, you are looking at the boundary of the hyperbolic space, which is sort of different. Yeah. In the other case, these are bounded. Here, nothing is bounded. No, no, of course, of course. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. You are welcome. More questions? Uh, just on, um, it's not exactly uh, the main, the central topic of your talk, but can you tell me a little more about the problem in S2? Also, you mentioned something, right? You have yes, yes. You <laughs> said that there is some limit, uh, which the limit in the yes. S case of S2 is a, uh, is the, a, equator. A the equator, the equator, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, limit in the sense, um, like uh, Grom of Hausdorff, uh, what, uh, what, what, what limit is this? Uh, uh, if I recall, it's just the the what was it? The tangent vector, the tangent vector of the curve, or even more than that. Uh, the tangent vector goes to the Orthogonal. equator, equator, okay. yeah. and it doesn't have any self-intersection in the case of the sphere. Okay. Uh, okay. So I can measure it sort of spirals. Just a minute. Let, let me get there. I want it spirals to spirals around the equator. Yes, that's right. Both ends, both ends, but uh, here you see. In this case here, you see they go up and down, up and down, but at the end, they end up, uh, if you think of those things going up, and so they go slowly, they go down, 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 until they just go around the equator. That's all they do. Okay. In any of, the, of those cases, see this or this. This one here does not go lower than the equator okay. but this all depends on the size of the vector in the other case the size doesn't have so much in the case of the hyperbolic space the size of the vector which would be the little a on that problem or the or the doesn't have a very special uh, a special uh, role in this case here the the size of the vector has a very special role Let's see. It's very interesting. What is in the, the other one, in the other case, what really has a special role is the type of the vector V. Mm -hmm. Here, just the size of the vector. Different things. <laughs> yeah. What is the two-dimensional analog of this? Is the mean curvature flow? Or... Yes, yes, the mean curvature flow would be the, uh, in this in this direction, we just worked, uh, I mean, when I say we, because I've been working with students, etc. this Fabio also was a former student of mine, and in the mean curvature flow, what we did was work with, uh, again, mean curvature flow is a very open problem. I mean, you can have many, many different kinds of solutions. So what we did was uh, concentrate on the solutions which are given by parallel evolution, by parallel hypersurfaces. Mm. And then this, uh, it only occurred in, we worked with this in the, yes, in the all ambient, in the space forms, okay, space forms. 
And in that case, uh, it turns out that you can only have this kind of mean curvature flow if the surfaces are isoparametric. And so in each case, we ended up finding the exact moment when they collapse, when they collapse, especially in the case of the sphere. In general, these flows may develop singularities, right? You, you only look at cases where you don't have singularities because you are in solitons, right? Yes. Yes, I don't have, I would say this is because we are in a very special space. I mean, we are working with H2, S2. There is another paper which we just uh, uh, put on the archive, is instead of looking to the hyperbolic space, we looked at the uh, light cone on the Minkowski space. And then, Again, with the curvature, uh, you don't have any problems. But what happens is that in case of the curvature, what ends up, in, you can have points where the curvature is zero of the curve. Yeah, I'm talking about the curve. Now, in the case of the light cone, you have a, you have a, uh, a correspondence between the the mean curvature the the curvature let's say the uh, the curvature flow and the inverse of the curvature flow mm. and what happens is that the singularities appear in the inverse curvature flow i see Understood. although the curvature itself does not present any any singularities but it it can get zero. Anyway, th this, this on the light cone, actually both papers are on the archives. The light cone was just, we just put it a, a few days ago. And the hyperbolic space is there for some time already. I mean, a couple of months or so, I mean. Okay, very good. Uh, any more questions for Katie? Well, if not before thanking Katie once again, I want to uh, amend a little bit of my presentation. I forgot to mention a lot of things. Katie was also president of the Brazilian Mathematical Society, and uh, she received a lot of honors. She's a member of the uh, Brazilian Academy of Sciences. She received uh, honors from the President of the Republic, but not the current one. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know what the English for it is. Uh, Comendador, Grand Cruz. Um, and uh, so there are so many things that I forgot to mention. I apologize. There are too many things uh, for this. So let, uh, um, let me ask you to join me to thank once again, Katie, for this nice talk uh, with a nice uh, clap of our hands. So. Thank you very much, Katie. It was an excellent experience to have you here. Uh, by the way, um, I just received a message of uh, Enrique, who said he had another um, uh, meeting at this point. So he um, is saying goodbye and thank you very much for your uh, for your talk. So uh -huh. thank you to all of you for attending this conference and. Um, I guess we will meet you in two weeks from now. Cathy, you, I will formalize the invitation in the other seminar that we have, okay? Some point. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you much for the for, invitation again. Thank you for coming. It was a very beautiful talk. Thank you, as usual. <laughs> you are being